right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bavia, and I am the health educator at MS Focus. I want to welcome everybody to this discussion panel that is going to be hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I am joined this evening by Damian Washington, Eric Nelson, Tim Carr, and Zabel Brown, who will be here shortly. And they're going to be sharing with us their experiences of what it's like to live as a black man with multiple sclerosis. After the discussion, we will open the floor for your questions and comments. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator, Damian Washington. Damian is from New York City and has helped tell stories in over 30 commercials and voiceovers for brands like McDonald's, Chex Mix, Chex Mix sorry, Ring with Shaquille O'Neal, and Realtor.com with Elizabeth Banks. His YouTube channel, No Stress MS, about life with multiple sclerosis, has over 5,500 subscribers and viewers. It, they say the channel helps bring levity to the often grim topics of autoimmune diseases. We're pleased to have all of these gentlemen join us for a discussion of this important topic. Damien, Eric, Tim, thank you for being with us today. We sincerely appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. So we're going to start this discussion with a question that I'd like to ask. And Damien, you can take it away right after. Oh, child, I don't even need to do an intro. She got a question already. Let's go. <laughs> can you tell us about your experience in today's world as a Black man with MS? Me personally, um, I, I think it's in some way, I'm lucky to have had decades of not good things be happening um, in not only um, black male um, in, the, in the medical system, but also multiple sclerosis. So we've had the 15, 20 years to nail down, like, no, this is the course that you should go. And, and now I roll down that instead of trying to figure out so many various different things. So that, that's really how it's, it's been in, in my road. I'm just glad I'm here now even though I would rather not be here at all. And Eric, how about you? Well, MS has its challenges, but you know, I've learned how to push through um, a lot of the challenges and um, you know, with my family, my friends, um, support group ministry, um, it has helped me uh, to keep going and not to give up having a strong support system. Mm -hmm. Right, that's important. And Mr. A good support system is very important, actually. Uh, my MS was, is not obvious. And for years, I was running around like nothing was going on, though I was feeling a lot of things. But I never talked about it. I don't talk about it much. Uh, and... People, when I would tell somebody at MS, they look at me and say, you don't look like you got nothing wrong with you. Look at you, you look fine. Be like, and, I'm sick, not ugly. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> but generally, uh, I had kind of a cavalier attitude about it because I was acting and doing all the things I wanted to do. It just slowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I was very uh, nonchalant about it. No big deal in my mind, even though it was a big deal. And I never talked about it to anybody. Well, I didn't tell people, obviously. And uh, that uh, was generally my feeling. And most people, well, I talked about it on TV once. And that made a difference. I got a lot of response on it. And I used to interview. One thing, one of my focuses on as a reporter was, I was set out on stories related to MS. And when I'd interview people about MS, they were reluctant to talk to me about it until they found that I had MS too. Then they wouldn't shut up. Right. Uh, but generally they said, and I felt this too, it's nice to meet somebody else in the same, you know, with what you got. Because I, like everybody else, didn't know what MS was and was surprised to see it and, and uh, didn't know how to react to it. But uh, I, and now I do 
I'm anxious to meet people with MS. And all during the time, I was diagnosed in 1998. And all during that time, I wanted to meet other people with MS. People mm -hmm. worse off than I was and people better off than I was. And the worse off, I wanted to see how they got to that point. People mm -hmm. in wheelchairs, people using canes and things like that. Because I wanted to know what was going to happen to me. And I asked my doctor, he couldn't tell me. He couldn't say for sure what was going on and what, what was happening with me or what would happen to me, as is the case with most people. Thank you for sharing all of that. Do you have anything else to add, Damien or Eric? No. All right. So I've, next also, I've also written a book about MS. It's called Me and MS. And people oh. think, because it's me and MS, they say uh, when they when they uh, look at it, they said me and Ms. What Ms. What is that? You and your woman or something? You and your your girlfriend? And uh, they don't know who MS is until they open it up and read it. Right. Uh, the, the book is not has no doctors in it or anything else. It's just me and my experience with MS. Just Google it right now, and I know those people who say that don't have MS because it's clearly <laughs> like I'm looking at it and it says me and MS. It don't yeah. say me and me is. Me like, and me. <laughs> people do. That's the way they do it. Even, even the the uh, publishers that call me and want to help me promote it and stuff say, uh, this is so-and-so and so-and-so, and I want to talk to you about your book, Me and Ms. Yeah. Say Ms. Yeah. <laughs> no. But you can find it on, on uh, what, what can you find it, Sharon? Amazon. Amazon, that's right. You can find it on Amazon. It's called Me and MS. Yes, and my name's on it. I will uh, definitely share the link in this uh, webinar for everybody to have. Yeah, it's it's there. It's uh, short. It's not a long read. It's very simple and to the point. And it's ba basically my, it's good for somebody who doesn't know anything about MS to give them an idea about it. And for those who do have MS, it talks about some of the things that are common to most people with MS the things that we wonder about and uh, runs the gamut. Some of the stuff is a little, uh, when my wife read it, most of it, she said, I, I, I talked too much in it. I told too much. It was too, too much, uh, what do they call that? Too revealing. Too revealing. She said it was too revealing. She wanted to I, cut your airtime. She's right there off camera, like wrap it up, Tim. <laughs> no, actually to give you a, give you an example, one of the, one, chapters in there was when I wet my pants live on TV. While I was on the air, mm. I pooed my pants mm. and nobody knew it. And, uh, but in the beginning, I wrote stories about things that would happen to me, MS related things. And this story I wrote was about my pin and my pants on the air. And I ended the story with, uh, Doing a good job is like wetting your pants um, in a dark suit. It gives you a warm feeling inside and nobody notices it. Wow. Tim Carley, ladies and gentlemen. That was my, uh, <laughs> my take on that, my attitude. That's a gem right there. That's a bar. I'm going to use that moving forward in my life. I'm going to use that. That was beautiful. <laughs> mm. Mm. You know, it's funny because I, I put um, out to my audience like, hey, y'all, what questions should I ask here? Um, what, what, do you, what do you want us to, to talk about? And one of the things that, that came to the top was, is it true that Black males always end up with the most aggressive forms of MS? And while I'm going to not exactly say that, I am going to say, according to neurology.org, um, neurology.org, evidence suggests that African-Americans with MS have a different clinical presentation, increased disease burden and incidence, and long-term worse outcomes versus their white counterparts. I think it's very much more aggressive in us. So whether or not that's because of access to medical care, whether or not that's a rural versus a city thing, the numbers tell a story. And just looking purely on the numbers, 
if you are African American and you have the central nervous system condition, you're most likely going to have a worse ride um, as far as that's concerned. So to even answer that viewer's question, which I know is on other people's mind in this space, in some ways, we, yes, but we're not exactly sure why um, MS is more aggressive um, in African American folks, especially African American males. But that's one thing that is on the hearts and minds of people that I wanted to make sure that I put out here. Yeah. I did not know that. Oh yeah, this is youtube.com slash no stress MS. You're gonna find a whole bunch of things that you ain't know. Um <laughs> it, it's it's just one of those things. It's yeah, I'm I'm very good on camera because I've sold products on the television for years with right. us people but i'm also a voracious nerd and there's i cannot tell you the computer stuff that's in my house so the computers and the the performing just sort of came together and as that was coming together the only videos people watched were the videos about ms and i was like i don't want to be the ms guy and montel williams that's the ms guy but it's like you got to give the people what they want so I, I started making exclusively MS content. And now I'm talking with people like y'all. I'm on panels with the illustrious Eric Nelson and Tim Call. Like it's, this is, it's a beautiful space to be in. Um, but um, of course you'd rather not be here, but I'm glad I'm here with all of y'all. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So next question, if you gentlemen are ready. Mm -hmm. How has pride played a role in your MS journey? Hmm. I know pride is a, it's a very important yeah. personality trait for everybody. So come on, Pastor Nelson, go speak on, speak on it. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it definitely pray, plays a, a big role on you because, um, this this word called manhood mm -hmm. you know and so for me um as a man when there are <laughs> things that you are used to doing that you no longer can do right. um it, it it plays in your psyche um it affects your pride um and it makes you feel less of as a man you know for example being able to take the trash out being able to, you know, just being able, you know, do the little things like bring the groceries in the house, mm -hmm. things like that can affect your manhood. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Another thing also is, um, so I, I'm, I'm an athletic type of guy. Mm -hmm. I used to, I used to, you know, play sports all my life. Um, in fact, um, the month before I was actually diagnosed. I was in the gym working out. I was, I had a program that I was doing. Everybody, you know, heard my, my story, but I was doing a thousand push-ups and I got up to 900 something push-ups and my left hand gave out and I fell on my face and I just, and it happened twice and I knew something was wrong, mm -hmm. but that was, you know, my pride was a little hurt. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, so, should be proud. I I can do yeah. five, so not <laughs> something is. It's amazing. Well, you could you could do more than I can now. So you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, <laughs> I actually wrote, I actually wrote uh, a uh, editorial or article for the MS Foundation years ago. It was called the art. The segment was called Men and MS, mm -hmm. and I talked about pride. And what pride, what MS does to pride. I mean, it's out the window. You know, MS just basically throws all kinds of pride out the window. Mm -hmm. It humbles you. You know, it, it makes you a oh. lot more humble. Oh, yeah. It realizes things that you can't do, mm -hmm. that you can't do. Uh, but I also say, don't stop, try, don't stop doing it. You'll just have to do it a little slower. It's just going to take you longer to do it. You can still do it, most things. Uh, but pride is a big factor in MS. And mm -hmm. that's why I think a lot of people 
men don't want to talk about it, don't want to say anything wrong unless somebody asks them. And uh, I personally don't like to hear moaning and groaning with people. So I don't do it myself. Like, my head hurts, my leg hurts, I don't feel good. That's nice. I mean, it's mean to think that way, but sometimes I do. And so hey, I don't. You, you hit them with it. Like, oh, man, their head hurts. You're like, oh, your head hurts. <laughs> oh, my, my whole nervous system hurt. So. Yeah. I <laughs> But that's also when you need somebody who knows you, who knows when you're not feeling right, who knows when you're you're fatigued, and who knows. When things are, and for me, that's my wife. She knows when things aren't right. She can just look at me and see that uh, something ain't working right, or she'll ask me, "What's wrong?" And I'll say nothing, and she'll say, "Yes, there is." And generally, she she's right. Mm -hmm. And so it helps to have a person. Uh, or people who know the difference, who know you and know that what you're not doing or doing is not right and can call you on it, bottom line. Like the fatigue, is, uh, which is invisible. Nobody knows. They just know you're sitting in a chair and don't want to get up. Right. Absolutely. My, my wife also was diagnosed with MS as well. So Ooh. we, you know, we can um, piggyback off each other and help each other and encourage each other and and we can recognize each other's symptoms um or when something is not right and so she's helpful because um when when she's down i'm able to help her to, to try to pick her back up and vice versa so it, that's that's always good um and that plays a, a role on your pride as well too because you know when when your wife has to do the majority of the lifting when you know when you sitting back just watching because you can't do it but i tell people all the time you know try to focus on what you can do versus on the things that you can't do because if we continue to focus on what i used to do and what i can't do then that's when that depression sets in that's when all types of um, bitterness sets in, anger sets in, you know. So try to focus on things that we can still do as men um, and try to perfect those things and to get better at those things. Um, I learned that through sports. Um, when I play ball, you know, if you want to become a better shooter, keep shooting. You get on the line, ball, shoot, man. shoot. That's right, keep shooting. You know, one thing that I, when I talk to people sometimes is I always say, don't let MS be an excuse for not doing something, mm -hmm. not trying something. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you, you can try and if you fail at it, so what? But yeah, MS, gonna, you can't just, say, I don't yeah. want to do that because I have MS for me, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I just and don't I'm, go for that. I'm, I'm going to temper that, uh, Tim, with like, I have MS, my feet don't work too big. I have MS, my knees all spat, like you, for very valid and real reasons, you can't do that because MS. Mm -hmm. However, maybe you might not be able to do it today. Can we do it next week? Can we do it next month? Can we even have the hope of a thought that we might be able to do it? That's mm -hmm. what the condition has in me. And it's it shifted like, all right, well, I'm not going to do this now. I'm not going to do this uh, tomorrow, but maybe I can do this next week. Mm -hmm. That sort of um, uh, moving the needle uh, and, and giving myself grace that the needle has moved, uh, this medical condition certainly has, uh, has, has made more important. Giving oneself grace when one is unable to complete the task or do something that you usually do has been something that it's kept, it's helped keep me as sane as I possibly can be. And it's helped, helped me to, it's helped push me to keep me moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That is some great advice from all three of you to focus on what you can do versus what you can and to be mm -hmm. with yourself. There's mm -hmm. a whole organization called Can Do MS, baby. Like, yeah. get on with it. 
it, it, it's a paradigm shift of uh, always being able to do exactly what you need to do whenever the heck you want want to do it and need to do it and needing to plan for that and the pride being in the way of that and the second the third thought of like man i've never had to usually give this a second or a third thought man mm -hmm. you can do it like those sorts of things mess with your ego mess with yeah. your identity mm -hmm. it's it's less the, the the ego specifically but your identity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i heard I've heard a statement that I, I kind of like, and it's, I have MS. MS doesn't have me. That's what they say. Some days MS have me, though. I'll tell you that right now, Tim. Yeah, but I know, yes, I do. Sometimes it <laughs> snatches me and, and knocks me on my butt, but, but I not will every not release day. this hole from you for three days. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of um, how it is, and you, you, you ride that. Um, and that's what the grace... Um, is for and uh, personally I, I meditate often uh, three times a day if I can at least twice and that pause there's nobody else in there there's no expect no outside expectations and the more I learn to sit I learn I learn to be able to uh, not hush uh, those internal expectations but listen to them and say thank you and not exactly attach my identity uh, to, to, to being able to do those things or not being able to do those things. So as you continue the road of living with multiple sclerosis, your identity will change. And hopefully you get things inside your paradigm and your identity and personality that give more grace to the human um, that you are and less grace to the identity that you have built up until uh, you got diagnosed. Very well said. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I do the work on the <laughs> YouTube.com slash no stress that means. Holler if you want. <laughs> so to segue into my next question, Eric mentioned this briefly um, about the term manlyhood. So I wanted to know, do you feel that MS has taken away from your manlyhood? Bellas? Well, um, for me, there are things that, you know, like I said, you know, um, as a man, you know, you, um, you know, some things that you can no longer do uh, mm -hmm. as a man. Um, and so you have that feeling that it has taken away um, those things um, because MS is a thief and a robber and it, and it will rob you of, you know, your manlyhood. It will rob you of things, um, you know, not just for just men, you know, as well, but for, for women as well, um, but for as for men, um, it can and it does, um, but you know that's again like we said in the beginning, that's where you really need that strong support system. Um, you know, I can I can honestly say there, when when you look in a, a lot of the MS groups, mm -hmm. they're mostly women in those groups. Right. So there's really not a good, strong platform for men. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? They have uh, women, African-American women with MS. They have, you know, uh, you know, MS honeys and they are, all, you know, all these different types of, of, of oh, yeah, women. women okay. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't really have a whole lot of, you know, places where men can just mm -hmm. be men can be boys you know and just kind of not to say vent but just kind of share our, our experiences um and trying to encourage one another um I, and i think that's um what's really needed in the ms community is for for men i i find that ms has affected uh my some of my acts of chivalry, like 
opening the door for my wife when we go somewhere. I can't do that because I can't stay up with her. I'm okay. behind her. I can't get ahead of her and open the door for her. Uh, getting up to, to pull a chair for her, opening, the, you know, pulling the chair back so she can sit down. Because sitting up for me right now is tough. It's a it's a struggle sometimes and just getting there. And also, I've just started using a cane, something I've fought for the last many, many years that I've had MS. But it's gotten to the point now where I limp a lot. And walking with a cane is a little tough. And I walk slower than everybody else. And in fact, that fact was brought out to me by my grandchildren. We were walking to the park. And my little three-year-old daughter, uh, granddaughter said to me, Gramps, why you walk so slow? And I looked at myself and I said, I guess I am. So then she had a solution. She grabbed my hand. She said, I'll walk with you. Let me take you. So she grabbed my hand. She starts pulling me up. To, and I had trouble keeping up with her. Mm. But, uh, it's been that way. And up to that point, I never, I didn't use a cane. I stayed away from that. I said, no, 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 all the time. But a lot of uh, helping me, and I realize it now, was my wife. She's the one that pushed me to do stuff, like disability. She pushed me to do that. I said, no, I don't need it. I don't want it. I, and, right. and everything else. And so uh, now she's the, and she, when we go anywhere, when we fly airplanes, I take a wheelchair. And the airlines will give you a wheelchair. And I felt guilty doing that because I could walk, you know, not fast, not well, not efficiently, but I could walk. So mm -hmm. why the wheelchair? But the wheelchair is great. Let me tell you, all it gets you through security faster. You get on the plane first. <laughs> that yeah. benefits. But it also has benefits for my wife because she gets on with me. So there, there's some benefits to a wheelchair. But it's scary, too, sometimes when you're going through a crowd and you, you think you're going to crash into somebody, you come close and people decide to stop and talk right in front of you as you're trying to get to your airplane or whatever real quickly. But there are a lot of things that I've done that benefit me through the urgency of my wife. At my I was very reluctant to accept anything that could help me. Mm -hmm. I've learned that don't say no. You know, it, it it usually is a pretty good thing. I play golf three days a week, two days a week. And that's something that I can still do. I ride the golf cart. Everybody else, it, nine holes, you don't ride a golf cart generally. That's that's in the golf world. Uh, but you have a push cart. But me walking and pushing the cart is rough and gets ugly. So I ride on the golf cart, which I did reluctantly as well. But some things you got to learn to accept things that you might not think you need, but you find out in the long run that you do. A wheelchair, it does help. And I think it, if in a way it can help conserve your energy mm -hmm. for the duration of the flight and when you actually have to travel. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, by the way all of you. I know it might be a difficult topic to discuss, so I really do appreciate you talking about important things that I think a lot of people want to hear but don't know how to ask, such as pride and manlyhood. So thank you for that. Um, one thing I would like to know, so we as humans often struggle to ask for help. How has being a Black man with MS affected the way you ask for help in your community? Hmm. I generally don't. Oh, that's, but do you ask, your community can be, you know, your relationships, your family, it can be your neighbors, your job, anything. Your church? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't normally have a, a, a problem with that. Um, I normally, um, right now since COVID, mm -hmm. I haven't really been able to really go anywhere. So, uh, because of COVID, um, so for me, that hasn't really been an issue. I think one of the issues, just this 
speaking as a, a support group leader and um, and some of the things that, that we uh, run up with is that in the community, um, there's not a lot of um, people receiving help that they need, you know, and um, well, I don't want to call them out, but I was going to say Medicare and, and they don't really do the best um, with their services and um, of trying to, you know, help, you know, have people um, the help that they need. And so for me, I mean, to answer your question, I don't really have a, an issue with asking. I don't usually have a problem. I do have a problem with asking uh, if it's MS related because I don't know, just, I just don't ask for help for most things. Generally, I can't think of any reason I would, I would have for that. Uh, I did have, I got to tell you about my Karen experience. There's a reason you need to help Tim. That's yeah, why I'm here right that. now. I, mean, I, I want it. You know, I don't, I've never, I really have been reluctant to ask for help for anything, for any special treatment because I got MS on my job. When I work, a lot of times my boss would say, does the MS have any effect on your work? And I'd say no. And I would go to work with a splitting headache, uh, numbness all over my body, mm -hmm. and, but it wasn't obvious. I didn't show it. And for years I say, no, it doesn't. And I don't want any special treatment. And uh, they did, I didn't get it either. <laughs> that was the other thing. But I didn't recognize it when it was, it was a problem, when I was having problems seeing things. I'd have days where I just didn't want to get up. I'd be at my desk sitting there and just not have the will or energy to get up and do what I needed to do. Um, and there was also a lot of stress. I got, that was another thing that affected me. That would bring on exacerbations. Uh, the stress of the job, getting things done on time. I had timetables I had to meet. And sometimes it was a little tough doing that. But uh, those, those, I usually didn't ask anybody to do anything. And also, like I said, my MS was not obvious. Nobody could tell that I, any, anything was happening with me. I couldn't get any benefits, especially on the golf course. They wouldn't give me no strokes because I got MS. You they know, never give you no strokes. <laughs> let me win the game. <laughs> yes, no, so, no, 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 sir. But the golf was related to the the Karen incident I had and not long ago. We play golf on a municipal course here in San Diego, and I ride a golf cart like I told you. I would we would unload the car. We park in a handicapped spot. I have a placard and all that. See, that was something my wife made me get and I got it. Um, and so we parked the car and I unloaded the clubs, my clubs and walked over to, the course was a little like a hundred yards away. So I threw my bag on my back to walk to the cart where I put my, my golf clubs. And a woman noticed that we were parked in the handicap spot, a woman who worked in a restaurant. And she saw me walking up to the course uh, with the golf bags on my back. And so she didn't know anything wrong. She thought I was perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. There was no obvious problem with me and, and reason for me to park in the handicapped spot. So she talked to my wife who was there, who said, she said to her, I have a friend who has uh, Alzheimer's or something. Yeah. ALS, and he needs a, he didn't need it that day, but he needs those handicapped parking spaces. And your husband just went up there and uh, you, you're parked in a handicapped parking spot and uh, it's just not fair, you know, that, that you should do something like that. Now, I don't know if she would have said that if it wasn't a black man walking <laughs> up the golf course, because there were many of us there anyway. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> my wife resisted uh, doing what she wanted to do. It was real gentle <laughs> and speaking to her and told her that I have MS and that uh, walking, you know, I'm lucky I can walk right now. So uh, the lady kind of felt bad. She kind of noticed her, her, 
uh, I don't know what you call it, but ignorance, put it that way, about what the situation was. She stepped and off then, her face, sir. She stepped out of her face. <laughs> uh, uh, so then she told my wife, well, uh, I guess you don't, uh, I, I, you probably noticed that there's a, a note on the car. You might want to take the note that's on the car off. She had written a note about it. And so my wife said, no, you get the note off my car, off the car. So the woman, you know, sheepishly went and got the note off the car. And, and uh, my wife tells me she seemed a little, uh, a little humbled about it and recognized that, you know, I had a right to be there to do that that uh, I wasn't taking somebody else's spot or anything like that. And so, uh, but that was my, my Karen experience. This woman was, uh, I didn't hear her. She never said anything to me or I never talked to her. Of course not. Hey, I'm, spe speaking of, we got, we got Zay Brown in the building, baby. What's going on, big fella? Man, what's going on, man? My people, man. It's good to meet y'all, all of y'all. Um, I was just listening to him, you know, talk. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Zay Brown, uh, MS survivor um, down in Mississippi. Uh, good to meet one of y'all. Um, and uh, I was just letting Mr. Carr talk, you know, and thing, you know. Um, it's good to have this. I'm glad Miss Miss uh, Server set up this meeting with us. Uh, it's good to meet all of you. Somebody, somebody that got something that I got is good to talk. You know, good to meet y'all. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm late. sorry I'm late. Uh, I, I was having trouble with my my uh, connection or whatever. So that's how it would be sometimes, my man. No, that no. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Say again. I'm sorry. Well, you go. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm just, uh, you know, like I say, it's good to talk to somebody, well, all of y'all that, that actually goes through everyday living, like, like Mr. Carr was talking about, you know, even his golf. I came in on the end of it, but I was listening, talking about, you know, him golfing and, he, you know, his wife helping him out and stuff like that. And uh, it just, me personally, and I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, you know, please. this 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 whole MS, you have to have, you know, somebody who actually, you know, even if they don't got it, they kind of know what you're going through day to day, day to day. And it gets so man, I mean, it gets it it it's definitely <laughs> something to get a positive team around you, you know, a positive, you know, because if not, you know. You may look normal, but you don't really feel normal. You don't feel normal. You no, know, you just, and like I say, just listening to Mr. Carr talking about he still living life, you know, golfing and stuff like that. That just let me know, hey, we can still, we can still live, you know, so. You, that, you know, you know, talking about golf, uh, a golfing friend of mine said, with the weather we have in San Diego, if you don't play golf, something's wrong with you. <laughs> And that's crazy because you you told it right by a daughter's mother San Diego. So, you know, I've been out there a couple of times and you know, um she's from there. So, you know, it, it I mean you right at the right spot, you know. Like I said, I'm down here in, in uh Mississippi. So uh I'm glad like I said, Miss 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 Sir. I'm gonna get that wrong, but I'm gonna work on it. It's okay. You know, uh, okay Ty, say the name right, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I know, but uh, I was like I said, I was anticipating. You know, she talked with me a couple of weeks ago, saying that she was doing this to me. So I was definitely looking to get in a room that something that we can relate to that we all got. You know, I got I'm from the south. You know, I, I got here and there so many people with sugar. You know, diabetes and stuff like that. But it's very rare multiple sclerosis. And especially to being us, you know, African American, you know, we, you know, we, we don't follow the show, you know, you know, but you know, we don't follow the show that, you know, but you know, everybody needs help. Everybody needs, you know, I feel, uh, and um, I'm just, I ain't gonna talk no more. I just happen to be here and listen to, you know. Oh, so, everyone. 
I actually want to ask you a question that I asked the other three gentlemen. It's yes. my personal favorite question, so I'm being a little biased. Yes. Um, how has pride played a role in your MS journey? Big pride. Big, it's played a big, huge, you no, know, I was diagnosed in 2018, 2017. And I wasn't, was, I was barely 32, I think, you know, uh, I was 32 and me having to walk with a cane, I was hard headed at first, you know, pride, you know, look, I'm, you know, I have, I'm not even 40, you know, at the time, of course, I wasn't even 40 and I'm still not, you know, got a couple more months, but I'm not even 40 oh, shout, now. Shout to the people who are over 40 years old in this group right here, right now. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> But go ahead, big fella. Please, please. The pride that you're talking about, I had that. And I'm to all y'all, I'm I'm tall. I'm a tall guy. I'm skinny, but I'm tall. Uh I'm six foot six. And that I'm six six yeah. and yeah, no, you're tall. You, I'm six two. You, so I, okay. I get it. I get it. <laughs> so you walking around, you so young, and you know, and to be honest with you. And Mr. Carr, I'm not saying your age or anything like that, but if I see yeah. older, literally walking normal, and I'm sitting up with a cane, I'm, I'm not even 30. No, I know, I know 70, 60 years old don't walk with a cane. And it does something to you because you're shame, you you know, your pride is in it. But this was broken. Being 6'6, six, six, that's a long fall. That's a long way, you know, when you fall, you know. <laughs> And, you know, they, they had to knock my pride aside, you know, because, and I started using the cane, shamed up there first, but now I carry that thing in most swag now. You know, I'm good you now. Are, you are not shamed to be on time to where you're going because you're walking with speed. You are Absolutely. not shamed to keep up with the crowd that you are with, and you're not shamed to be closer toward what you used to know uh, yes. and just without it and more in shambles. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm the cane. Like I said, I got, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I got to go out and style. So I got a couple of them, but my favorite is an orange cane that I got. Actually, it's in my car right now. It's an orange cane, solid orange. And, I, you know, my daughter, she's young, but she, the same one I was talking about, San Diego or whatever, you know, she even gets on me about not having my cane. If I pick up from the airport, if I don't have my cane, she like on me bad. And she's just 14. And she was doing that when she was like 11, 12. Like, is there some good support? To the MS ain't, it's bad. Don't get me wrong, you had your day. But if you can find a support system, you could have a good life, you know, for me, you know, it, I'm just going to speak for me. If you can find a good support system, and I'm not necessarily talking about somebody just, it, 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 money, it's not because money is not, the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, money. you need money to live, of course. But stuff like this, with me meeting with, with Mr. Nelson and, and Mr. Carr and Mr. Washington, this what makes me get through MS. This is what makes me get through seeing, hearing y'all guys and, you know, going through, you know, telling me the stories and I caught in on your story, Mr. Carr, and uh, just the little piece I got, you know, it's like, dang, wow, this man doing it, man, I, you know, let's get up, let's, let's go, let's take your meds, let's, you know, it gives you, it gives you inspiration to move, you know, you know, go on mm -hmm. with that. See, that prior to answer your question, we're, we're you, running, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, if you got that pride, it's, it's not MS. You have to, you know what I'm saying? Need mm -hmm. help. Because trust me, mine had to be had to be broken a couple of times or fouls that you, you know, and it's like I say, Mr. Carr, you, 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 that 6'6 six, six foul too long. That, that's <laughs> that, that's know, really how it is sometimes. You have to really kind of be broken to know what it is to be whole and to know what it is to put yourself back together and to know what you need to put yourself back together. So as Absolutely. much as we don't want to be broken, 
um, it's kind of necessary as part of it all for you to find a new wholeness. There, there's a few um, questions in, in, in the Q&A that are like, mm, let's try to sneak this in here right here. It, on this vein, how do you knock out depressive moods? I know I have my own jam here and we've got about five minutes uh, remaining, five to 10 minutes remaining. So I'm like, hey, uh, Eric Nelson, how do you knock out your depressive mood, sir? Um, for me, um, it's, it's, it's the word of God, man. Yeah. Um, I, you know, when I feel, you know, when I feel my symptoms come on or I feel, you know, kind of frustrated or whatever, I, I, I have to go to the word. Um, for me, that's what I do. Mm, mm. Tim Carr, same question. I don't get depressed. Amen. <laughs> All right, then Zabel Brown next. Like, <laughs> but no, no, I, I don't. I, I gloss over. Not, not that often. I, I, I have a very casual attitude. Most people don't think I ever get mad or anything like that because they don't ever see me mad. He's furious right now. <laughs> yeah, I. But I can get serious now and then. But not. It's no big deal. Usually, when people see me, like at church, they think I'm. When I tell them something, they think I'm joking. Like, you know, how, what's that joke supposed to be? You know, because I do tell jokes a lot of times. But I basically, what good is being depressed going to do you? That's the way I look at it. What's that going to do for you? How's that going to help you? So let it go. You got to learn to let things go. I'm going to jump, I'm gonna jump on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this back to you, Zay Bell Brown. But on that, being able to let it go, how part of the ability to do that, you have to recognize it. And in order to do that more um, efficiently, one meditates more often. And mm -hmm. again, I sit on a good day three times a day. So it's sort of a, like, I get up to meditate. Um, if I've eaten food and lunch, I meditate. And before it gets too dark, I meditate. One, it gives my central nervous system a chance to calm down and a period of time during the day where it's not doing nothing and all the fight and flight gets shut off and the rest and digest turns on. And that way I give myself, my body, an extra chance to heal. And that means I give my mind a touch more room to heal. And it's difficult at first. And it's one of these things that the more you do it, the better you get at it. And at this point in time, if I'm feeling depressed, I know I need to sit because after you sit, sat with yourself for a half hour, you will no longer be depressed. And if you do not believe it, please sit for 15 minutes with yourself for the week and finding your way to actually do the habit instead of putting it off to later or, oh, what a good is that? No, that is the work. That is the how you will find your way out of depressive moods. Say Brown Brown, get on this, please. <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell y'all this. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to discuss, and it ties into what do you do, depressed or whatever, where you fall into. For with me, and I don't know anybody else's personal situation, but you know, I had to talk over my my doctor about this, and I was, you know, telling her that you know I was gonna meet y'all guys today, and. I'm actually having this, but I'm a caregiver to somebody who needs caregiving, which is my mother. Uh, I just recently lost, about a year ago, two years ago, I lost my sister, her, her daughter, my sister, and she have catacea. So I pretty much do and step in. I'm not, I'm not pretty much, I'm not trying to get a no pat on the back or nothing like that because that's my mother. And so I give her a full, you know, I'm gonna take care of my mother. You know, my, my father, you know, died when I was like seven. So, you know, I've been working out one parent for a long time, about 30 years. So uh, me being depressed, you know, when I do want to, I can't because I'm actually caregiving for somebody who needs caregiving. And I, I need to be caregiver, but I, I can't pay no attention to it. Like, so every, and whenever I get depressed or I get is, Okay, what's my focus point? I need to make sure it's good. You know, she gets, she has highs and low, lows. She has catacea. Catacea is rare. It's very rare. It's a hereditary stroke. 
hereditary stroke and uh, she's had it since she was born. So, but only thing is, it's about it triggering. Well, if you lose a child, it may, it may trigger you. You know, if you lose a child and with her, you know, like I said, she comes and stay with me, you know, a couple of nights out of the week. And she literally, you know, thank me. And I'm like, mother, you don't have to thank me for, if you want to come over here, come on, come on over. You know, it's, I don't care. You know, I have a spare room for her and everything. And like I say, she's home alone. My stepdad had passed and had an aneurysm uh, about 10 years ago. So she's just her. So that'd be my, that'd be my, uh, if I'm depressed or whatever, I just realized I just don't even think, I don't, sometimes I don't even think, I, don't, I forget that I have MS until the time to take my medicine, which is two times a day. But my focus point of uh, pretty much just saying I, I have a objective or a goal that I need to take care of my mother. So I kind of, I don't have, I don't have time to be depressed. And plus me, y'all, you know, you know, you, and you and you and you, I mean, I don't have time for depression. Depression don't live for, you know, what's what not gonna get me is MS. That ain't gonna get me, you know. You know, my mother, you know, pretty much I'm caregiving for her. So that in itself, you know, keeps me away from that word depression, you know. Cause I wake up every morning, every day with a purpose. That's another keep you away from depression. Wake up with a purpose, like you said, Mr. Uh, Carr. He goes golfing. He's you know does stuff. He has something to do. Get up and and have something to do. We kind of like I say in my in my, my guy, Mr. Nelson. He said, you know, look to God, talk to God. Hey, I'm totally, totally in full of vouch for that. You know, have your relationship with God. You know, because you're gonna need him. You know, if you working with stuff we got in our vi- in our veins, the lesion we got. You're going to have to bleed, you know, God going to have you, you know. I read me a couple of scripts myself sometimes. So, Mr. Nelson, he's not, he's, he's right on point, you know. But well, like I said, so, go somebody, ahead, go. somebody in, the, in the audience is, um, there's like a few questions left, and I know we're short on time here. So, it's oh. like, hey, we got mm-hmm. like three, four black people in the room right here, right now, black men with MS. The, this question is like, I'm the only black man. Oh, that has multiple sclerosis around me. Do is that the case with the panel? Do you do you guys have the same experience um, where it's tough to find a support system because you don't have a lot of folk around you who sort of look like you in that way? Uh, Zay Bell Brown, come on. Well, I'm make this quick. If at first it was, I, I didn't have nobody. Nobody really, you know. But time went on with it. It got better. I started uh, linking with people that have this, and it's go good to meet up. You know, anybody that got in this, but African American most all because that's what I am. So yes, I, I, I. Well, I'm sorry. What was the question again? Have you met anyone else that is a black man that has MS? Because the questioner doesn't really have anybody around them that looks like them, um, especially with his condition. Uh, do I you have, have with that? I have. Um, in fact, um, the first when I first was diagnosed, uh, my uh, pastor introduced me to another pastor who was diagnosed, and he took me under his wing, and uh, we came, um, you know, good friends. And he considers me his little brother. I consider him my big brother. So for me, I say yes. Tim Carr. I had years I used to, actually, I was a patient advocate for Biogen, IDEC, that makes Avonex. And we'd have conferences. uh, And uh, I would would go to these conferences, and there were a lot of people with MS there, but no Black people. Mm -hmm. So I got back home, and I went to the MS Society. And I said to them, there are Black people with MS, right? And the woman kind of looked at me strange. And I said, are there any support groups with a lot of Black people in it? And she reluctantly told me, yes, there is one. So I went to the support group, and there were generally, it was mostly women, as you might think, and a few Black men. And when you say that it's more aggressive in Black men, there was one young man, he was in his 30s, 
And in the meetings we'd have, he'd be setting up chairs and doing everything in the world. And this was January. By December, he couldn't walk. December, he couldn't get out of his wheelchair. Thanks. But that really gave me a sense of how aggressive and how quickly this thing gets us. And uh, that scared me. Mm. Yeah, no, it's um, sort of a, a strange thing to, to balance. Um, you have this condition and then it messes with your identity and then it messes with your identity more because you don't even see anybody around you who looks like you. And so you just get farther and farther in this hole and now you have more pain, et cetera, et cetera. And so there, there's so many little things that chip away at your sense of identity. And once that has been chipped away at and sort of taken away from you, you have to rebuild it. You have to get it back. And that's what um, having meditation habits uh, for me, it helped me to regain uh, my identity. And the, 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 when you are out of control, the best thing to do is just sit and be with that and bring presence to that and invite in more, uh, more energy um, healing energy, uh, feeling good energy, uh, to, to sort of massage uh, that hurty part of you, because it's not going to happen instantly. However, I dare you to do it consistently. Um, it, that, that is something that it, it is untold how good it is. And even when you do read it, because it is in medical journals, reading it and believing it is different than living it. And knowing it. Got there for living. Got there for living. Yeah. So there, there's there's a there's a lot of different resources in this community. So somebody um in the in the in the audience says, hey, there's a Facebook group, uh, men with MS. Um if you don't you guys don't um have anybody else out there, um, but you have people digitally available. And as someone who built his first computer when he was 15 in 1994, the idea that the internet can transmit a video signal and sound signal with crystal clarity through space to hundreds of different people, that's unheard of, specifically in my generation. So the fact that this is possible, these Zooms are possible, it, we're, we're able to hold this space right here, right now, is novel and it's special. So please lean into that more, especially when you feel yourself feeling alone and lost. And yeah, maybe people around you that you can reach out and you know put your hand on their shoulder, they don't know what's going on. I guarantee you somebody on the internet of things not only knows what's going on with you, but they know what to say to you and to help encourage you, to help keep you going. We were talking about the uh, point of depression. I have a book. It's called uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And everything is small stuff. And it has some stories. That That's a long title, different. sir. Yeah, yeah. It, the, well, it's in parentheses. Don't, don't oh, sweat the small good. stuff. Wait, everything wait. is small stuff. But you uh, it, it's a good book to read. It'll, it'll give you some, some pretty interesting examples of people letting things go. Bottom line is how you got to learn how to let things go. And one of the lines that I remember from it was, if something happens to you, think about what this is going to mean tomorrow. If it doesn't make any difference in your life tomorrow, let it go. Bars. You got that right. Bars. Oh, I, I, we're, we're running slow here. So oh, we're low on time here. So it's like, hey, what would you tell a newly diagnosed African-American man uh, with multiple sclerosis, what would you tell that person? I, I know that's a lot to say, like, what would you tell somebody? But um, uh, Xavier Brown, I'm putting it on you right now. What would you tell a, a, a African-American person who just got MS? I would tell them, lace up, lace up, uh, lace up, please. This is going to be a journey. You can get through this. I want you to keep that chin up and whatever your doctors, medical, Lua Rogers or whatever, you know, you got, get you a good one. Get you a good That's one. If, you know, get you a good one and make sure you have support around you 
it ain't gotta be family like blood, but make that's the key word to surviving in this. You make sure you have a great support system. And support system don't necessarily mean your family members. Okay. Uh -huh. But you you have somebody that's gonna encourage you to do what you need to do. Cause if you don't no, I ain't cut you off, Zay. My bad. I'm like, I know I'm just watching oh. time. Like no. Pastor Nelson, what would you what would you say? I, I totally agree. Um, you have to have a strong uh support system. Um, I would say don't look necessarily towards family um to be a support system because they don't always understand everything that you are experiencing and going through uh, physically um you know but if you can uh, find like-minded people um that are like you um whether you know it's um a man or a woman you know <laughs> that's what i would say you know just try to find a strong support system. Mm. Tim Carr, uh, thank, thank you. My thank first you. thing I'd say to them is, you're not going to die. It's not, it, it, MS does not kill you. You won't die from it. But you do need help. You should look for support. Exactly. Look for support. Look for people who know what it is. Because most people, when you ask them, have no clue what MS is. Is that the Jerry Lewis thing? You know, they ask things like that. No, and they it's don't not know the Jerry difference. Lewis thing. They always say that, you know, and, and you got to, basically, I would say, don't worry. Find somebody who knows about it. Not necessarily just your doctor, or although a doctor's a good person to look at. Your neurologist, I should say, because all doctors don't know everything about MS. Yeah, they're right. Um, but it's not the end of the world either. That's the number one thing. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Yeah, the, the, what, what one has to begin to find within themselves is space within themselves. What does that mean? It means different things to different people, just like the medical condition. And that's where the meditation comes in. That's where the, um, the supplements come in. That's where all the little pieces that um, we stack on top of each other to have a half of an um, iota of wellness, a modicum of wellness. And that's something that you really have to begin to lean on and to be curious about. I would just say remain curious because people have answers. However, your answer is somewhere in the middle of that, somewhere to the left of that, somewhere to the right. Just like the medical condition, every answer is going to be unique to the person. Every answer is going to be different. And the thing that you are looking for, yeah, only you looking for. However, you're not the first person to be looking for it. And that, that's a dichotomy to really wrap your head around and to know that this is your new truth and to walk in that and add the more you walk in that uh no pun intended <laughs> the more you uh, i have just come to experience the more i embrace my ms and walk towards it certain symptoms start to peel away and they start to fall away and so it's important for you to meet your you're at and give yourself grace in that place and still give it love which is part of the grace but give yourself love and then things will begin to open up and it's difficult to see on the outside but once you taste it for yourself oh it's tasty baby yes. um before we say our goodbyes for the evening we answered all the questions. I just personally want to say thank you. This was one of the most beautiful webinars. I loved all the advice everybody gave. Mr. Carr, I'm definitely gonna use the dark pants and <laughs> as long as it's warm and feels good inside, but thank you all. I really do appreciate everybody sharing their journey. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Also, another point is MS is not the only problem. I have diabetes. I have glaucoma. So there's a whole lot of other things that go along with it. Uh, you need so, a lot of doctors, <laughs> sir. Yes, I, I got neurologists. I got oncologists. Not oncologists. I don't have cancer. But there's a little bit of everything. So just having MS is not the only problem you can have during Max, that. Consider yourself lucky. And then there's COVID. You can wait for that. Did everybody here get COVID? Yeah, I almost died. Twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. I got. I was I got, in bed for twenty days. My COVID joke I got is State Farm has changed its motto because of COVID. They now say, "Like a good neighbor, stay over there." <laughs> Tim Carr, ladies and gentlemen. Tim Carr. Okay, give it up. For him. Make sure you tip your bartenders. <laughs> So are we, are we, will I see y'all guys again? I mean, I'm just, or uh, like, did we, we have another one, Miss, Miss Moderator? Will we have another one? Uh, um, well, we can definitely discuss having another one. I mean, I, on the spot, I, mean, I like, I like talking to y'all guys, for real. I mean, oh, y'all. This, this is definitely lovely. And, um, after the webinar, we can discuss possibility of another one. This was, I believe, very helpful. And it brings us to the end of our time. So okay. if you missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Please reply, oh, sorry. Please reply to your registration email for information on how to access the recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Also, you'll be receiving a short survey when you leave the conference. We'd really appreciate your feedback. It helps us determine what type of information is most meaningful and helpful to you as the attendees of these conference. Our sincerest thank you to all of our attendees for your participation. I really personally want to thank the four gentlemen again for attending this conference and taking the time out of your Friday evening to share this information with everybody. Our next teleconference is going to be next Thursday evening, February 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern. Please join us for a discussion panel with three Black women living with MS as they share their experience as research participants. Ooh, also, I gotta wait a whole week? What is this, no. 1983? Like we got to wait for things now. We, we, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yes. And thank you also to our sponsor, Genentech. We sincerely, I'm sorry. I'm just so hyped about this webinar. I can't wait to get off the phone. But thank you to Genentech as well. Um for sponsoring. Thank you, Uncle Gene. Thank you, Uncle Gene. <laughs> thank you. I was the the MS Foundation for letting thank us uh, participate in this and this was a great I wouldn't have missed this sorry for my tardiness but I'm glad I met new friends like Nelson Mr. Carr Mr. Washington yeah shout Absolutely. shout shout to the MS Focus shout to Casey Minnesota off the finish shout to Deborah Foreman respect and peace and love and joy all of y'all thank you thank you gentlemen thank that's you. right thank you thank have you a, have a good one thank you bye all right